Hey guys, welcome back to my advice video for foundation. Now, first of all, why should you actually care about foundation if you're doing it? Well, the thing is, a pass mark is a grade four, but a grade four really isn't good enough anymore. And as we're noticing with kind of job inflation, as it's called, they really are expecting grade fives in order to get apprenticeships or degrees or uh, certain subjects at A-level. So we really need to hit those top marks in our foundation paper. On screen right now, I've got a breakdown of all the topics that come up and as a percentage. So these are just the main six topics. I'm gonna to go into a bit more detail in a second. And if you notice, there's not actually that much difference compared to higher if you watched my video before on just the general advice. And to be honest, this isn't actually the most useful piece of information. As we see, we've got number has about a quarter of the marks, 25%, and then we have 25% on ratio rates and change and proportion. However, the thing that's slightly more interesting is actually this. What you're seeing on screen now are the three assessment objectives for GCSE Maths, AO1, 2, and 3, assessment objective 1, 2, and 3. The first one is basically, do you know how to do the mathematical processes? If I give you two fractions, do you know how to add them? If I give you a percentage, do you know how to take it a percentage of a number? Do you know how to times two fractions together? That kind of thing. So these are the questions where it might say, simplify, and then give you some algebra. Or it might say, take a fraction of an amount. Take a half, what is a half of 52? Those kinds of questions make up 50% of the marks. And this is the real main difference between foundation and higher. So all you need to be able to do is actually do the processes itself. Now that might sound really easy and it might even be something that's quite positive for you. But I guarantee you, at least in my experience, a lot of students aren't actually able to do even the basics. And this is what I, this is my first piece of advice for those of you that are going to do the foundation exam. You need to really know and understand how to do the basics. So for example, do you know how to times and divide any number? So any decimal number, any whole number. Now the reason why I ask this is this is actually a grade one topic on Maths Genie, but the problem is a lot of students don't know how to do it. If I get you to do the bus stop method, will you make any mistakes? The answer by the time of your exam should be no because it'd be really tragic if you actually get to the point where you, all you have to do is a calculation and that's what you mess up on. And bear in mind that paper one is a third of your marks and this is where they test applying these basic standard techniques. And also things with ratios as well. Splitting things into a ratio is considered a basic standard technique, so you need to be able to do that. So whenever you come across a topic that you want to do, let's say percentages, do start from the basics to remind yourself and to kind of test yourself if you know how to do it. And try and do everything without a calculator. Just so, well, I mean, you get A, you know the process a bit better because you have to do it in your head, but B, you're basically testing yourself for paper one. Keep in mind that every single topic can appear in any of the three papers, any of them at all. Now, AO2 says reasoning, interpreting, and communicating mathematically. These are questions such as show that questions or best buy questions. So kind of the standard thing where you have to kind of back up your answer, explain your reasoning, that type of thing. And lastly, AO3, which makes up the last quarter of the paper, is solving problems in mathematics and other contexts. This would be like a real life example. And this, in my opinion, is where maths is actually relatively useful. So let's say if it's a Pythagoras question, they might say, you know, it's something to do with a lighthouse and a boat, finding the distance between them. Or they may say uh, a Best Buy type of question. Or they might say, you know, one person buys a house at this amount and they get a 10% profit. Another person buys a, a house at this amount and it increases by 15% each year. Who has the most amount of money or whose house is worth more? Uh, it could be an interest question. It could be something similar to that. But the idea is anything to do with real life is going to be that final 25%. So realistically, you can focus on AO1 and 2 and get 75%, which is a 5. But you still want to be able to do AO3 as well, just because it's unlikely you're going to get 100% in the first two. That's not me being mean to you, it's just that in an exam, everyone makes mistakes. Chances are you may mess up on a division question, for example. But that's okay, as long as you're getting it right 90 plus percent of the time. So again, my first piece of advice is focus on the absolute basics of each part of the question. If you know how to divide two numbers, that's already going to get you most of the way. Then you just need to do problem solving afterwards, and you have to be really honest with yourself. Do you need to practice bus stop method? Do you need to practice column method for addition and multiplication? If the answer is yes, then go and practice it. Again, this is a personal thing. No one has to know you're practicing that. You just need to know it for yourself. I should also just add in, just on the end, right, really quick, this isn't actually a measure of difficulty. AO1 is not easier than AO3. For example, AO1, solving simultaneous equations, which is very difficult in higher and foundation, 
is AO1 because it's just a standard technique. Same with something like estimating the mean. Those are all AO1. So they can be hard topics still, but you're still talking about just the procedure itself, not applying it to any context. So when we get into this breakdown of all of the overall topics, what you need to be thinking of is noting down which topics you find easy, medium or hard and focusing on those. So this is kind of a, a way of focusing your revision, targeting your revision, because this isn't going to be every single topic. It's going to be the ones that come up the majority of the time. OK, still study everything if you have time. But if you're strapped for time, this is a really good way to focus and target that revision to maximize what marks you can get. So what does this all mean for the foundation paper per topic? Well, if I go through the topics really quickly, first of all, there is a high proportion of those AO3 type questions. So there's non-standard context-based questions. So there's real life questions for things such as geometry, ratio, and proportion. With C1, so AO1, there is, generally speaking, probability algebra and statistics with almost all of the algebra questions, about 80%, being tested in this AO1 standard procedure way. When I say standard procedure, I'm talking about the actual process itself. So just to go over that again, in terms of real life examples, you're mainly looking at geometry and ratio and proportion. That's where most of those C3 questions come from. For uh, algebra and statistics, almost all of them are C1. And for C2, the highest proportion comes from interpreting charts and diagrams in statistics. So those are the topics that you can kind of expect to get for C1, C3 and C2. That means after each paper that you do, you can kind of judge what's going to come up next. Because you know that C2 and C3 should make up a quarter each and C1 should make up half of the questions. So if you haven't had much C2 or C3 yet, you can expect that's coming up in the second and third papers, for example. As a result, if you feel that you're doing pretty well in foundation, I would definitely recommend focusing on geometry and ratios and proportion for your revision. This is because they have the kind of complicated real life situations which tend to throw foundation pupils off. So if you feel like you're pretty good, maybe you're working at a grade four, you want to push yourself to a grade five, then you definitely want to work on geometry, ratios and proportion. So anything to do with real life context in terms of shapes and also things like ratios and proportions as I've already said three times now. So let's start going through the individual topics. Now, again, I'm going to talk, uh, discuss this in terms of the six major topics and then break them down inside. So the first one we're gonna go through is number. Now, across the past eight years, this is where I'm getting this information from, by the way, 55% of these marks are for C3 questions. So C3 questions, just to, just to remind you, are real life questions. So over half of the marks that you've ever get in number have come up for real life problems. And these are looking at the four major operations, adding, subtracting, times and dividing. So it could be something sim uh, a sim uh, as simple as, let's say, I go to buy three apples and it costs me four pounds. I buy 12 apples. How much does it cost me? Something along those lines. Or four people can sit at each table. I have 108 people coming for a party. How many tables do I need? Things like that. They're applied to real life situations and these make up over half of the marks in the number topic, which is huge. It's over a 12th of your overall grade. So again, these can be integers. They can be fractions, which again, fractions tend to be more on the AO1 side, but still they can do this, but it also includes calculations from context, as I mentioned, in terms of real life examples. So at foundation, you really, really, really need to be good at this kind of core arithmetic and applying it to situations that they give you. Again, you need to be able to apply it to real life examples. There are tons of word problems online that you can practice with this. I'm going to leave some links in the description for questions that you can find and practice for each of these topics, or at least places that you can find more questions. Now, what about next? Well, the next kind of biggest section for these AO3 marks comes from fractions, percentages and decimal calculations. And percentages in general make up 64% of the overall marks in problem solving questions. That's huge. Well over half. Now, we've spoken about AO2 and AO3 now. So what about AO1? Well, I'm going to give you the topics that basically are entirely AO1. So first of all, is place value and standard form. 91% of the time, it's just AO1. So it's just the kind of basic procedure. So do you know how to spot a place value? Do you know how to write a number in standard form? Do you know how to tell if a number is in standard form? And can you change a number between standard form and ordinary numbers? 91% of the time, this is just in regular, hey, this is a standard form, change it into an ordinary number. Okay. The next one is ordering, 88% of the time. 
this comes up again in AO1. This means they're just going to ask you, hey, here's a bunch of numbers, and these numbers can be integers, decimals, and fractions all mixed together. They do not have to be the same type of number, otherwise it'd be a bit you know, easy according to them. But it can be all fractions, for example, or it could just be a mixture of fractions, decimals, percentages, and integers. 88% of the time, this is just AO1, where they say, hey, here's five values, order them in ascending or descending order. Now here you want to be really, really careful. You need to read the question. Ascending means smallest to largest, descending means largest to smallest. Make sure you read that. The way this is graded, by the way, is you get marks. So you may know that this isn't just a one mark question. You get marks for converting it into similar notation. So for example, if you have a mixture of decimals, fractions, and percentages, changing them all to fractions, for example, will give you a mark. But also, if you put them in order, and let's say you get one wrong, if I can cover up that one that you got wrong, and the rest of it's correct, you can still get the second mark out of, out of the third mark. And of course, you get all of the marks if you get it correct. Shockingly, I know, right? The next one is operations and relationships makes up 90% uh, of the grade. Over, of the total C1 marks, the AO1 marks. Powers and roots, 92% of the time is an AO1. So again, calculating cube roots, square roots, and also squaring and cubing different values. You should know the square numbers up to 13 squared, ideally. And that means you also know the square roots of those numbers too. So 5 squared is 25, you should also know the square root of 25 is 5. With practice, you'll just remember this. Cube numbers, you don't need to know that many to be honest, and you can just work them out. It's rare they ask you to work out the cube root of something. And of course, fourth and fifth roots, you don't really need to worry about at all. Now, the next one is fraction, decimal percentages, conversions. 89% of the time, they're just asking for AO1, the basic skill. So do you know, for example, they give you three over 20, write this as a percentage. Three over 20, write it as a decimal. What is 0.79 as a, decimal, as a percentage? Things like that. Hopefully that's not too bad for you guys, um, but again, that's 89% of the time, it's going to be AO1, they're just asking for the basic skill. You don't need to worry too much about problem solving. That's the point of me telling you this, by the way. These topics, you can really just focus on the basic skill and not worry too much about real life examples if you're pressed for time, okay? And lastly, we have rounding and estimation. 78% of the time, it would just say, round this number to three significant figures, or, estimate the following and they give you all of this. With estimation, I'm going to give you the trick that I tell all my students, which guarantees you get the mark. Round everything to one sig fig. That's all you have to do. Round it to one significant figure and then you're done. Now with rounding and estimation, the rest of the marks, and this is quite interesting, the rest of the marks are C2. So that is reasoning and applying that kind of logic. So things similar to bounds, essentially, if you remember that. But it's mainly to explain the effect of rounding an estimation on answers. So if you round down, how does that affect your answer? Now they won't tell you that you rounded down, you just have to know that you rounded down and then say, yeah, you know, how'd you do it? Negative numbers also tend to be assessed as AO2, so applying it, um, or at least reasoning and things like that, that's because they're a bit abstract. Um, so you just need to be able to do that. So it's not just the basic procedure, you do need to be able to kind of reason and justify with it as well. 22% of number properties also C2, so what does that actually mean? Well, these types of questions will be giving examples and counterexamples to prove or disprove a certain statement. So, for example, it could be, um, what are the factors of an even number? Do they have to be even as well? As a random example off the top of my head, you need to be able to kind of prove that as well. So number properties are things such as prime numbers, square numbers. You also need to know things like even and odd numbers, what is an even number? Can you tell me? Can you tell me what an odd number is? Can you tell me what a prime number is? Knowing that will help you with those parts. Algebra. Now, whenever I talk about AO1, a lot of students say, oh, it's the easy stuff. And I think algebra is the best example at, <laughs> at why that isn't true. Because the overwhelming majority of algebra is tested at the AO1 level. Yeah, I guarantee you, AO1 algebra or at least algebra in general, is stuff that you generally don't really like. So going over some of the kind of uh, major points, simultaneous equations is 100% AO1. Just asking for the procedure. Very, very, very seldomly they've ever asked you to apply it in a context, which is really good. 
Uh, the next one is quadratic equations. It rarely appears on foundation, but it can appear on foundation. It's a grade five topic. So again, if you're aiming for that grade five, it's a good one to go through, being able to solve quadratics. And it's 100% AO1. They're not going to ask you to solve a quadratic in a context or prove slash justify something about quadratics. Functions. So anytime you see F open bracket of X, 82%. So again, with number machines, stuff like that. Linear graphs, 92%, including gradients. So again, the majority of the time, they just want you to draw a linear graph, calculate the gradient of a linear graph or whatever. There's no real um, kind of complexity or applying it to real life. It's just the process. Now, I'm not saying the process is easy by any means, but you're not going to have to, you know, interpret it in a real life context. You're not really going to have to uh, justify anything and justify a gradient being a certain way. And lastly, non-linear graphs. So things like quadratics and cubics and all that fun stuff uh, make up 94% of C1 marks. So again, what that means is 94% of the time it's AO1, 6% of the time it can be AO2 or AO3. Extremely rare, extremely rare. So almost all of algebra, which is probably one of the harder topics, just in general, not just in foundation, is all AO1, majority anyway. So again, AO1 does not mean easy. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means it's not applied to real life and you're not asked to prove or justify something. You just need to know how to do it. It's still very tricky. So in my opinion, in my opinion, if you're going to do this, uh, you're quite fortunate in the sense that there are basically an unlimited number of questions that you can get. Because in my experience, AO2 and AO3 questions are very hard to write. So there are far more questions that are AO1 out there to practice. That's your advantage over some of the higher students because you get to basically just look up, hey, um, simultaneous equation questions and you'll find billions of them. Whereas if you need to find it in a context, it's a little bit trickier. There are fewer questions, so it's harder to practice. So you have lots of practice here. So in terms of AO2 and AO3, I should definitely go over that because this makes it sound like it's all AO1. It really isn't, okay? So in some of the other subtopics, you can be asked AO2 and AO3 questions. The first one that comes to mind is substitutions and formulae. So being asked to substitute numbers into a formula, it's actually quite balanced. About 60% of the time, it's going to be AO1, where it's just, they give you a formula, let's say F equals 3A plus 2B, A is 1, B is 2, what would F be? As an example. However, 20% of the time, you're going to have to do a little bit of justifying. And 13% of the time, it's in a real world context. So it could be something like F in this case represents the amount of fuel needed on a journey. A is the weight of the, people, of the car itself and B is the length of the journey in, it, in and of itself. And then you still do the substitution. Okay. And in terms of, and again, it could be also like temperature, things like that. The C2 marks within the algebra topic in general, so this is being able to apply it, come from translating a worded context into an algebraic expression. So there is a whole section of this on Maths Genie that's really, really good. But for example, they might give you a triangle and they tell you the sides, but it's all algebra. X plus one, X plus two, X plus three, um, work out what the perimeter is, right? Write an expression for the perimeter. The perimeter is 50 centimeters what is x for example or what are the lengths of the sides so being able to do that is c2 and that makes up t about 20 percent of the overall c2 marks and of course this can be used with things like angles as well word problems it can be used in a variety of contexts that's why it's very very useful uh, the next thing is sequences attract the next highest percentage of c2 ao2 marks and it's about 29% for linear sequences. So this is where you're adding the same number each time. And 21% is a non-linear sequence. So it could be doubling the number each time, or it could be a Fibonacci sequence, for example, something along those lines. And this is essentially, most of the time it's, hey, uh, is this term a member of the sequence? So let's say they give you one where it's like, I don't know, adding two each time. So it's two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, yada, yada, yada then they might ask you, okay, is 52 a member of the sequence? And you have to work it out or prove it. So that's why it's AO2, because you're proving something. I promise I'll talk for a little less on this topic, but this is going to be um, proportion and rate of change and ratio. So it's actually very similar to number uh, in the sense that 
A large percentage of them are AO3, which means you're applying it to real life situations. So it's mainly with proportion. So what do I mean by this? Let me give you some context. So for example, you know with recipes, so they might say, to bake four cookies, you need uh, 10 grams of chocolate. How much chocolate do you need to bake 12 cookies? For example, that's a good ratio question, uh, proportion question. Could be best buys and then direct and inverse proportion. So it takes two painters three hours to paint a house. How many hours would it take for one painter to do it? That's an example of inverse proportion. And of course, if you um, uh, you can have inverse and direct proportion as well. So it could be uh, two carats cost four pounds. How much does eight carats cost? That's direct proportion. And again, all of this is on Maths Genie and Corbett Maths. So I'd recommend going through those. And of the 34% of the AO3 marks, so over a third of them, uh, were units of measurement, which are normally four or five mark questions. So they're the real beefy questions. And this is mainly compound measures. So what do I mean by compound measures? Well, compound measures is actually a really big part of foundation maths. However, I don't see it taught or studied all that much. But what is compound measures? Okay, this is things like speed, distance, time. So speed is a compound measure. Pressure, which is force over area, is a compound measure. And density, mass over volume, is a compound measure. So speed, density, and pressure, those are the three compound measures you need to know about. And you also need to be able to rearrange their formulas or use formula triangles to work out what the other values are. So for speed, you don't just need to work out speed, you need to work out time sometimes, or distance. These make up the five markers because it might be something simple, uh, similar to, um, okay, I want to drive from London to Leeds. Uh, London to Manchester takes me three hours and it's a 50 kilometer drive. Manchester to Leeds, I travel at a speed of 60 miles per hour, uh, or kilometers per hour, because I've used kilometers before, and it takes me one hour. What's the total length of the journey, for example? And you need to know that you need to use the distance from London to Manchester and the, work out the distance from Manchester to Leeds and add them together. And then what's my average speed for the journey? Well, what you need to do is take the total distance, work out the total time, and then divide them. You know, so you need to be able to do that. So it is always applied in kind of real life context most of the time. And again, that does test AO1 technically, but it is an AO3 question because you're applying it to real life. And it does the majority, well, over a third of these AO3 marks comes just from speed and density and pressure. So they're really, really, really important formulas. Again, speed is the one that comes up the majority of the time, but I've seen density come up a really good amount of time as well. And they might shove in some other topics with that as uh, in, in, in addition to that as well. So again, distance, speed, time graphs are really good. Standard measures, so you need to be able to convert between meters, kilometers, um, den uh, grams and kilograms and things like that. Proportion graphs, reverse percentages, and then simple and compound interest all come under this big umbrella. That's why percentages, I said, were so important in my video, my previous video, because it comes up in like all of the topics. So again, reverse percentages, so, I mean, you guys know an example of that, and simple and compound interest. Geometry is quite a quick one to talk about. Um, the Probably the most surprising thing is that there aren't really many, if any, AO1 or AO2 marks. So they very rarely just say, hey, here's a rectangle, what's the area of it? Hey, here's a triangle, what's the perimeter of it? Very, very rare indeed. Instead, 84% of the perimeter and area marks are AO3, using it in real life context. So this is something like, Farmer Todd has a field that's a rectangle and it's this size and you know, that kind of stuff, you know? Or someone has a, um, they want to pave a garden but there's a fountain here. How, much, how many stones does he need? What cost is it? Stuff like that. And then volume and surface area also make up 81%. So you're talking about 3D shapes there. Um, there is another kind of surprisingly high uh, proportion of C3 marks. So 56% is Pythagoras' theorem. So again, it, they do ask you about half the time, hey, here's a right angle triangle, work out one of the three sides given the other two. But half the time as well, or just over half the time, they actually apply it to real life. So it's similar to what I was saying about like a lighthouse and a ship and then finding the distance between them. Basically with Pythagoras' theorem in real life, it's almost always going to be, hey, what's the distance between these two points given some other information that you have. Probability, everyone's absolute favorite, not really, but anyways. <laughs> Sets and Venn diagram take up 
20%, a fifth of the total marks in probability. That is huge. That is unbelievably huge. So a fifth of the marks just from Venn diagrams and sets. Bearing in mind that sets and Venn diagrams are essentially the same topic. So you need to get good at those. You need to focus on those. If there's any doubts on either of those, I would 100% focus my revision on that. Before I did anything else on probability, I would focus on that. A fifth of the marks is crazy. It's unbelievable. Another misconception I just want to address, by the way, is this idea of frequency trees and tree diagrams being the same thing. They're not. So you can actually have frequency trees and tree diagrams appearing in the same set of papers. So you do need to know both of those. It, they're not mutually exclusive, just so you're aware. Uh, speaking of mutually exclusive, mutually exclusive events were the most likely to be examined at the AO3 level, about 52% of the time. So normally they'll have some kind of ratio or complex fraction work. So here's a good example. They may give you a table and it's rolling a dice. So numbers one to six, and they give you the probability of getting the numbers one to four. Then five and six, they say they're in a ratio of two to one. What's the probability, you know, complete the table. Or it might be something like uh, there's three different uh, counters. So there's blue counters, red counters, white counters. The probability of getting a blue counter is 0 0.4. And then the ratio of white to red, I think were the colors I used, is two to one. Or they can say that red counters make up a quarter of the overall bag. So then you know that's 0 0.25 and then you can work it out. And it's normally given in a table. So the way I explained it at the beginning is not the clearest but hopefully giving you those examples of the questions will give you an idea of where they are. Um, and the rest of the probability content, so all of the other subtopics, were basically C1. So AO1 just testing the basic kind of understanding of it. So things like conditional probability or calculating probabilities, just AO1, okay? They give you probabilities you need to be able to calculate and uh, manipulate them yourself. Lastly, but certainly not least, we are on to statistics. Well done for making it through this far, assuming anyone still is. But let's have a look. So the vast majority of the content is C1 and C2. So what does that mean? Well, it means most of it is going to be, hey, draw this chart or hey, what does this chart mean? So something that's quite rudimentary, but you do need to know how to do it. In terms of the charts, there are so many. Pie charts, bar charts, tally charts, Venn diagrams, etc. Lots and lots of different stuff. And in terms of the AO3 marks, so the real kind of problem solving real life examples, it was mainly just charts and graphs, which were about 10%. So again, this could be something like a pictogram. And they say, you know, someone's done a pictogram to talk about the types of foods that people like in their um, class, for example, and you need to interpret it or work out how many people like this or fill it in, fi finish it off. And then lastly, averages and spreads making up just over a quarter, so 26%. So in terms of the actual statistics marks, let me talk about something that means more to you. 64% of them were charts and graphs. 64%. That is absolutely, absolutely insane, considering that statistics makes up a big chunk of your paper. So 64% were for ch charts and graphs, so you need to know how to draw and interpret pie charts, bar charts, pictograms, all of those types of diagrams. If you can do that, that's 64% of your statistics marks already done. Uh, the 39% were on charts and graphs were C2, which means that you're essentially asked to analyze and read information from the graphs. Again, if you know how to draw them, being able to read them and do that C2, the AO2 stuff, it's basically the same thing, right? If you know how to draw a pie chart, you should be able to interpret a pie chart too, because you know what it means, okay? When you're able to construct something, you know its purpose, you know how, how it works. And of course, you need to be able to estimate the mean for a group's data, coming up pretty frequently. So when you have a table and it's like zero to uh, two and then two to four and blah, 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 you need to know how to work out the mean of that. So that is um, pretty much all of the data I have. I'm going to put a link in the description for some additional data that I didn't think was too relevant for this um, kind of video. For example, how likely certain topics are for the first five questions of a paper, for instance. But overall, it's, this is what I would focus on is every topic that I've mentioned, get that to 100%. Make sure you are 100% okay with it, and then focus on the other topics. Again, depending on when you're watching this, this idea of this video is to really focus and hone in your skills and also get you to the grade five stuff. So the grade five stuff again is going to be those worded problems. There's more complex real life situations, and I've told you exactly which topics come up in that 
regard. So you should be focusing on geometry, for instance. So Pythagoras and things like that. But I hope you found this useful. Again, every topic that I mentioned, really focus on that in order to boost your grade up as much as humanly possible. But I'll see you in the next one and check out the description for all those links.